don't know what that is. Go on. And when I think that God, his son not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in. That on that cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Amen. Welcome this glorious risen Jesus day. We're here to celebrate the risen Christ this morning. You know, every day is a celebration of the risen Christ. And we're here today to tell the message of the good news that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. Amen. Death could not hold him, the Bible says. So praise God. It's great to have you with us this morning. What a glorious day. I have me summer short on, so it's truly summer. Uh, I'm a fashion freak. What can I say? <laughs> but look, look, God is good, isn't he? He is. Isn't it amazing? Isn't it great to be alive in him today? You know, we just want to welcome you all. We want to uh, thank, you for, uh, thank you for your support. And uh, yeah, Brenda has an amazing message that the Lord has given her that she's going to uh, bring to you this morning. I'm just going to pray before we start off and then, you know, hand the meeting over to the Holy Spirit, yeah? Yes, praise God. And just be expecting today what God is going to do in your life, yeah? These words that we speak, the Bible says, are not our own, they're his. So uh, let me just pray and ask the Lord to open up your heart, amen? Amen. So Father God, I just come before you today. Thank you, Lord. And Lord, I just lift up everyone that's watching this this morning. And I ask you, Lord God, no matter where they're at this morning, Lord, if they're down in a pit, would you raise them up today? Yes, Lord. Would you heal them? Would you transform their lives? Would you bring life into their life, Father Yes, God? Lord. Lord, would, would you bring light into their darkness, Lord? And I just ask you, Father God, Lord, the word says yes, that Lord. you open up their minds that they could receive the word that is spoken. Yes, Lord. And Lord, I pray, Father God, that at the end of this, we will walk away knowing something more about your goodness Hallelujah. and your mercy. Hallelujah. So Lord, I just give you, Brenda, I give you my wife, I give you everyone that's listening here today. And I ask you, Father God, to open the floodgates of heaven. Yes, Lord. And bless them abundantly. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So Thank glory you. to God. Glory to Hallelujah. God. Praise the Lord. Oh, such a beautiful day today. And uh, Easter Sunday. And Christians all over the world were celebrating uh, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that he rose from the dead. And because he lives, we too shall live. Uh, so God is so good and we are such a blessed and such a privileged people here this morning. And again, I just want to thank you uh, for tuning in and make sure that you like and that you share because it's so important uh, to get the word of God out there. Because as we always say at Firebrand, the word is powerful, it's living, it's effective and it has the power to change and transform people's lives. So get liking and get sharing so that other people can hear the good news of the gospel here this morning. So before I get into today's message again, I just want to start off just with a short prayer. And Lord, I just thank you, Sovereign God, once more for this glorious day. I thank you, Sovereign God, for every person that's listening in. Lord, I ask you, Jesus, Sovereign God, that you will fill them from head to toe with the power of your love, Lord God, that you will fill them with the light of your presence, O oh God, that you would remove all heaviness and all despondency and all fear. And Lord God, that you will clothe them um, with your garments of praise this morning as they look to you. Lord, we ask you, Jesus, just for every heavy heart, sovereign God, that they would experience your glory and your power and your healing this day in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. Okay. So, God is good. So, you know, when Je one day Jesus went up onto the Mount of Olives and he was with his disciples and his disciples asked him, what is the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And Jesus began to give them a number of signs, things that would happen here on the earth before he returns. But one of the things he also says was this, because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. That sin will be rampant everywhere. That the earth would be full of violence and cruelty. 
that people would become desensitized to sin. And you even see that what would shock a nation 20 years ago would be headline news. Doesn't barely make the papers, doesn't barely make the headlines today. People, because sin is rampant everywhere, people have become desensitized to sin. And in the book of Hebrews, the Lord tells us that we need to encourage one another daily, lest our hearts also become hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. You know, our hearts can become hardened because of unbelief, because of compromise and because of complacency. And in the world today, people's hearts are so hardened to the gospel. People's hearts are so hardened, so cold and so uncaring because of the environment in which they live in, because of all that's happened in their lives and because sin is rampant in the world today. As I says, the Bible tells us that we need to guard our hearts. You know, it's very important that we don't become complacent at this time, because if we do, we fall into spiritual apathy. And what that actually means as Christians, that we become cold and uncaring. Our hearts become callous. Our hearts become hardened. That we're no longer caring about those who are bound in sin. That we're no longer caring about those who cry out um, for, for mercy and for help. That we become unmerciful, that we become insensitive, uh, no longer desensitized and not sensitive uh, to the Holy Spirit and not caring about the purposes and the call of God upon our lives. You know, we, even within the church, many people have feel that they have lost the passion that they once had, that they are no longer sensitive uh, to the Holy Spirit that they're no longer feeling, that they've become unfeeling, that they've stopped believing in the promises of God. They've lost all hope and they've given up the fight. And you know, they become insensitive to the Holy Spirit because of the deceitfulness of sin. And they've stopped believing in the promises of God. And so many people, you know, they stopped believing in the promises of God, perhaps because of a prolonged trial. They feel like God is not turning up for them. They feel like they're not getting any breakthrough. Their hearts become discouraged and they stop believing in the goodness and in the promises of God. And they begin to give up the fight. Well, it's Easter Sunday today. And I just want to remind you this morning of the deep, deep love of Jesus. I want us to look this morning at one man's heart, which was hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. A man's heart who was cruel, cold and uncaring. A man who was unmerciful. And yet he was changed and transformed by the power of the cross. When he looked to Jesus, his life was never the same again. Again. And you know, this morning I believe that there are many people whose hearts are hardened and God just wants to pour out his spirit afresh upon you and he wants to remind you that he loves you and that he is indeed a good, good God. And he wants to, as, as I says, just pour out his spirit afresh upon your life. You know, there's nobody too far for God, too far gone from God. There is no pit so deep that God's love is not deeper. You know, even if you've been praying for somebody and their hearts are just so hard and so callous uh, towards Jesus, don't give up because Jesus can change and transform the hardest of hearts. It's his love that melts us. It's his love that changes and transforms us. So if you want to open up in the Gospel of Mark and it's chapter 15, And it's from verse 16. And this is what it says. Then the soldiers led him away into the hall called Praetorium. And they called together the whole garrison. And they clothed him with purple. And they twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they began to salute him. Hail, King of the Jews. Then they struck him on the head with a reed and spat on him. And bound a knee, they worshipped him. And when they had mocked him, they took 
the purple robe off him and put his own clothes on him and led him out to crucify him. Verse 22, and they brought him to the place, uh, to the place called Gotha, which is translated the place of skull. Then they gave him wine mingled with myrrh to drink, but he did not take it. And when they crucified him, they divided his garments, casting lots for them to determine what every man should take. Now it was the third hour and they crucified him. And the inscription of the crucifixion was written, accusation was written above, the king of the Jews. With him they also crucified two robbers, one on his right and the other on his left. And so the scripture was fulfilled, which says, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who destroy the temple, you who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priests also mocking among themselves with the scribe says, he saved others, himself he cannot save. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross that we may see and believe. And even those who were crucified with him reviled him. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama shabaka, which is translated, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of those who stood by, when they heard it, says, look, he is calling for Elijah. Then someone ran and filled a sponge full of sour wine and put it on a reed and offered it to him to drink, saying, let him alone. Let her see if Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus cried out with a loud voice and breathed his last. Then the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. So when the centurion who stood opposite him saw that he cried out like this and breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was indeed the son of God. Now, when Jesus was after being, was after standing before Pilate and all the crowd was saying, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate handed him over to the soldiers, handed Jesus over to the soldiers. And the man that was in charge of the soldiers was, in, was called the centurion. And he was an officer in the Roman army. And he was in charge of over a hundred of Roman's finest soldiers. He would have climbed up the ranks by his skill, determination and loyalty. He was ruthless at carrying out orders. Being highly trained, he showed no mercy, no emotion, no compassion while on duty. And this is this man, the centurion. And you know, I just need to get a drink for a second, hang on. It's very warm today. And you know, um, at the time of Jesus' crucifixion, uh, the Romans had crucified over 30,000 people in that region. And crucifixion was invented by the Persians, which was modern day Iran, 500 uh, BC. It was also used by Alexander the Great, but it was the Romans who perfected the art of crucifixion. They used it as a punishment to maximize pain. It was a slow and it was a torturous death. And those who were crucified were mainly slaves, rebels, thieves and murderers. It was a shameful death. And on this particular day, the Roman officer was in charge of making sure that Jesus was flogged. He was a cold, hardened soldier who was used to seeing men die. But what was it that would change this hardened man's heart? What was it about this crucifixion, the crucifixion of Jesus, that was so different from all of the other crucifixions? 
Loads of times I've heard people say that, but many people died on the cross, they would say. What was so special about Jesus' death on the cross? What was the difference? What is it about the cross of Jesus that can change and transform a person's life? What was it that the centurion saw in Jesus Christ? Well, in Luke, first of all, in Luke 23, verse 22, it says this. That Pilate, when he was handed, when he handed Jesus over to the centurion, said, I find no guilt in him, no reason for him to be put to death. And Pilate actually said this three times. It tells us in the word of God that he committed no sin and no deceit was in his mouth. Jesus himself said, can any of you prove me guilty of sin? You see, Jesus was sinless, and um, even though he was fully man and fully God, yet he was sinless. Even though he was fully man, he was fully God, but he was sinless. The Apostle John says to us, you know he appeared in order to take away the sins, and in him there is no sin. Again, we're continually reminded that we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we, yet he was without sin. You see, it's important to understand this, that only a sinless, perfect Jesus could both pay the price for sin and offer forgiveness and eternal life to all who come to him. So we see in the centurion seeing that he was sin, that he was um, free from all guilt, that this was an innocent man being put to death for a crime he hadn't done. Pilate himself said that it was because of envy that they handed Jesus up um, to be crucified. It was because of envy. The Pharisees were jealous at Jesus because of he, he was popular and because he drew crowds onto himself. But you know, he didn't do any crime. He was sinless and without fault. He was spotless, uh, the Bible tells us. The other thing that the centurion would have seen was, was how he endured suffering and how he didn't try to defend himself. You know, Jesus was led like a sheep to the slaughter and as a lamb before his shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. He remained silent and it's a beautiful picture of the meekness of Jesus Christ. You know, meekness is strength controlled, it's power under control. He could have called on a legion of angels to come and to help him. You know, we see in the Gospels how with one word Jesus uh, calmed the storm, how with one word um, he raised people from the dead, how with one word he opened blind eyes, how with one word he healed the leper. And Jesus only had to speak one word and everything would change. But instead, he kept his mouth silent. He didn't retaliate. He didn't revile. He didn't call on the angels and call upon his father to come to his aid and to help him. He willingly gave himself up uh, to be mocked, to be ridiculed uh, for you and for me. He willingly lay, uh, gave up his life and lay himself down. He never defended himself. He never defended himself. You know, you think of Jesus and the cruel mockings that he endured, you know, before he was actually crucified. They put a purple robe on him, they spit at him, they pulled at his beard, they whipped him 39 times. And the 39 lashes was designed to bring you close to death. And some died from actual shock. So he would have had open wounds all over him. You know, he didn't defend himself. And he suffered horrific um, beatings, horrific mockings, horrific beatings. 
And all of this was a fulfillment of prophecy that was spoken 750 years beforehand by the prophet Isaiah. That by his stripes we were healed. It tells us in Isaiah 50 verse 6, I offered my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from mockery and spitting. He didn't hide his face from mockery and spitting. And he went through all of that for you and for me. The centurion would have been amazed. Like he had seen many people, he put many men to death. And he would have seen people plead uh, for forgiveness. They, he would have heard men say that they were innocent. He would have heard men cry out for mercy. He would have heard men, you know, just try to defend themselves and try to resist the cross. But when he looked at Jesus, he didn't see any of that. He seen a man who was like a lamb led to the slaughter. The other thing that the centurion would have seen was this, how he offered forgiveness. You know, when Jesus was on that cross, he thought of others you know, despite himself. But when he was carrying that cross as well, before he was crucified, you have to remember this, there was open wounds on his back and he carried that cross two and a half miles before he was executed. And as he carried that cross, uh, the centurion, centurion would have seen how he taught of others despite his suffering. All throughout the mockings, he was silent. But as he began to walk up that hill to Calvary, to the place where he would be crucified, he began to speak. And in Luke 23, verse 24, this is what he said. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And he says, daughters, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves. Daughters, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves. Because he was concerned about what was going to happen to them after he was going to um, die because they had rejected the Messiah. But also the centurion seen that when he was on that cross, he taught of others, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And he said this while they were dividing his garments and casting lots. You know, they gambled for his robe. You know, I just think of that picture and it's a prophecy as well that was being fulfilled from Psalm 22. And that Psalm was actually written a thousand years before Jesus um, was crucified. I'll actually read it and this is what it says in Psalm uh, 22. You just think of this, right? All, everything, like Jesus came to fulfill the word of God. And it says in Psalm 22, it says this. It says, the dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look and stare at me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. For my garments they cast lots. He goes on to say that nobody, everybody was looking at him, everybody was mocking him, and there was none that had pity upon him. They encircled me and they gape at me with their mouths like a raging and roaring lion. He says, I am a reproach of men despised by people and all those who see me ridicule me. They say he trusted in the Lord. Let him rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. All of this was written a thousand years before uh, Jesus was actually crucified. So Jesus was a fulfillment. He came to fulfill prophecy. Incredible, isn't it? That that psalm was actually written a thousand years before Jesus was crucified. But it shows you 
the kind of suffering that Jesus went through as well. And there was the soldiers as Jesus was hanging on the cross and they were casting lots for his garments. They were laughing and they were joking. They, were, they had no mercy whatsoever towards Jesus. And yet Jesus offers them forgiveness. And he says, Father, forgive them for they know what they do. And that forgiveness was extended to the centurion. And he would have been amazed at this. He also offered comfort to a dying man. And we know the story that there was two thieves on either side of, of Jesus who were crucified as well. And one of them, you know, mocked and reviled him and, and didn't, you know, uh, he actually cursed him. But the other thief says, Lord, be merciful to me. And Jesus, in his suffering, as he took the sins of the world upon himself, and as he hung there, and as he was exposed and put to open shame, he turned to that thief who was deserving of death. And he says, don't be afraid, for as surely I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. It's incredible. Because Jesus was completely selfless. He didn't think of himself for one moment. When he was on that cross, he was thinking about you and about me. When he was on that cross, he was thinking about those who were um, who had nailed him to the cross. Those who were mocking him. He was thinking about those who were next to him. And about that dying man who cried out for mercy and who cried out for forgiveness. And even in his suffering, he was offering comfort uh, to him. You know, he also seen supernatural signs. You know, the centurion, he would have seen uh, how darkness fell upon the earth. And just like in the book of Exodus, when a ninth plague in Egypt uh, came, when God, uh, God poured out his judgment upon Egypt, uh, the plague in Egypt was so thick that it could be felt and it lasted three days. But this darkness was so thick and it could be felt, but it lasted three hours. It tells us in the word of God, for God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus was plunged into darkness. Jesus suffered the wrath of God. It tells us that he takes upon himself our transgression. He became a curse for us. I don't think we realise the power of the cross. I don't think we fully can comprehend the sufferings that Jesus endured for us. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. You know, in 1 John verse, chapter 4, verse 10, it says this. It says, this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Do you know what that word actually means? Because I think it's, Perhaps one of my favourite words, that Jesus became a propitiation for our sins. And what that means is, is atoning for sin. It's an action meant to regain someone's favour or make up for the wrong done. It's a removal of God's wrath by dying in our place for our sin. Christ removed the wrath of God that we so justly deserved. And he turns it into favour. He doesn't turn wrath into love. Because God already loved us fully. But he turns it into favour. So that his love may become known. Doing us good every day. In all things forever. Do you understand that? You know the Bible says that we were dead in our sin. And that we were by object. Um, we were by nature object of God's wrath, that we were under a course, that God is angry with sinners every single day. 
and you know that the world is under, under a curse, that we are slaves to sin, that we are corrupt, that we are defiled, that every single one of us falls short of the glory of God. But on that cross, Jesus became a propitiation for our sin, meaning that he broke the curse, he removed God's wrath so that we can receive God's favor, so that we can be reconciled to God, so that we can enjoy the blessing of of God and that we may know God the Father as our Father. The Bible says that he who believes in Jesus, he has given them the right to be called children of God. This was all that Jesus did for us on the cross. On the cross, Jesus was reconciling the world back to God. You know, when he was on that cross, he cried out and he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It wasn't that Jesus lost faith. You know, it was in his humanity. He um, understood what it was like to be separated from the Father. For the first time ever, he knew what it was like to be forsaken by God the Father. You see, he knows what it's like to be forsaken. He knows what it's like to be in deep darkness. He knows what it's like to, co uh, to have shame and for, for your sin and for your life to be exposed before others where people ridicule you and mock you um, because of who you are or because of the things you've done in your past. He knows what it's like to live in a hopeless state. He knows what it's like to be separated from God the Father. You see, without Christ, you are in darkness. Without Christ, you are living in a hopeless state. You're living in a world without hope. You're living in a world without hope. But Jesus has come to bring you out of darkness. And he has come to reconcile you to God as Father. So that in him, you can walk in the light of the Lord, that you can become a child of God, that you can walk in the light of light of the Lord. He's come to break the course. He was dying for our sin and he experienced the agony of being separated from the Father. And he cried out with a loud voice, Father, into your hand, I commit my spirit. And then he said, it is finished. Once and for all, the cross of Jesus Christ, what he accomplished on that cross, it, oh, well, what he accomplished on that cross was he died for the sins of the world, that whosoever believes in him would not perish, but have eternal life. When Jesus bowed his head and when he had committed his spirit unto God, the centurion glorified God and he said, truly, this man was the son of God. He's seen that this was no ordinary death. He's seen the love of God manifested in the cross of Jesus Christ. He's seen God's love and God's mercy. And he looked to Jesus. He looked to his nail pierced hands. He looked when his head was bowed and with the crown of thorns and with the blood running down his cheeks. He seen the suffering that Jesus endured. And he said, a man whose heart was hardened against God, a man who had cruel intentions, a man who was uncaring and unloving and unmerciful. His heart melted when he seen Jesus die on that cross. And he said with a loud voice, truly, this is the son of God. You see, this is it. God demonstrated his love that while we were still enemies of God, while we were still his enemies and while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. But the good news is this is that yes, he did die for the sins of the world, but on the third day, he rose again. He rose again in physical form. 
He appeared before his disciples. He was seen by over 500 witnesses. They seen the holes in his hand. You remember Thomas says, I'm not going to believe unless I see and touch the holes that are in his hands. And Jesus came to him and he says, look, Thomas, you know, Thomas, Doubt and Thomas. And he says, look, Thomas. And he's seeing the holes in his hand. You know, Jesus uh, appeared to them many, many times. He, he appeared to them over 40 days before he ascended to be with his father. Jesus conquered sin, death and the grave. And he has come to change people's lives, to transform people's hearts, to give hope to the hopeless. It says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will take away the hardness of your heart and I will give you a heart that is tender and that is responsive, a heart that is willing and obedient, a heart that longs for me, a heart that desires to follow after me. You know, according to church tradition, that centurion, his name was Long, Longinus, Longinus, and apparently he became a devout follower of Jesus and he died a martyr by beheading. You see, at that cross, Jesus can transform and cleanse the blackest of hearts and soften the hardest of hearts. And Jesus died for you and for me. And this morning it's so important to remember that he not only died, but that he rose again so that you may have eternal life. And maybe, as I says at the beginning, you have lost your passion. You have stopped believing because of all the stuff that you're going through in life, because of anger, resentment and rage. Maybe you, like the centurion, cursed God and didn't care and, and didn't care about Jesus and, and, and the price and the crucifixion and the price that he paid for you. And today the Lord is saying, turn to me and I will soften your heart. Maybe you feel that you're dead, you just, like the walking dead, you're dead in your sin. But God can make you alive in Christ Jesus. You know, today, do not harden your heart, but come to the cross and ask Christ to forgive you for your sin. You see, the centurion, he seen his need for a saviour. And he seen his sin. And he seen that he was undeserving of God's mercy. You know, as I said, sin is rampant everywhere and people have become desensitized to sin. We actually live in a generation that people don't even know what sin is anymore. But sin is missing the mark. Sin is that twist in your character. Sin is what corrupts and defiles a person. Sin is what keeps you bound. And the wages of sin is death. But the gift that God offers is eternal life. For those who believe in his one and only son. So today do not harden your heart. But come to Jesus. And let him take you out of darkness. And out of hopelessness. And out of despair. And bring you into the light. And bring you into his kingdom. Let him pour out his spirit upon you. In a fresh and living way. He's given us a new heart. That we may walk with him that we may know him, that we love him. You know, it tells us in the word of God, we love him because he first loved us. And my friend, God has demonstrated his love for you, that while you were an enemy, while you were still bound in sin, Jesus died on that cross so that you can be forgiven and so that you can go free. But the thing is, the cross demands a response. It demands a response. There's no point just looking at it. There's no point in saying, admiring it. There's no point in saying, you know, I'll get right with God down the line or whatever like that. It's time to get right with God and to get right with Jesus today. 
this Easter Sunday, it's a new day. You can have a new beginning. Come to the cross and ask the Lord, Lord, forgive me. And just like that centurion, your life will be changed forever. You will be transformed and you will know Jesus in a real and intimate and personal way. He's not a distant God. He's a God who is present and a God who is near. And as Christians, he's a God who lives within us. So I encourage you just to respond and to open your heart. And if you have become cold and uncaring and apathetic, come back to the cross this day and let the Lord pour out his love afresh and pour out his spirit on you so that your eyes can be fixed on him. Let him give you an undivided heart, singleness of mind, so that you can run your race to win. So can we pray in Jesus' name? So if you've heard this message and if it's spoken into your life, in any way, shape or form, come to Jesus today. And people have said, you say it, come to Jesus. How do I come to Jesus? You simply come in faith. You come in faith. And you come with a sincere heart. You come with an acknowledgement that you are a sinner and that you need to be saved, that you need forgiveness. That's how you come. You come through faith. So let us pray. If you mean this, say this prayer after me. Lord Jesus, I thank you for the cross. I thank you, Jesus, that you died on that cross for my sin. I ask you, Lord God, to forgive me. I ask you to free me. I ask you to wash me clean. Oh Lord, I ask you, to forgive me for my hardened heart, for being uncaring, for being unloving, for being unkind. Lord, I look to you and I cry out for mercy. And I ask you this day that you, O oh God, would pour out your love upon me. Lord, I receive by faith the gift of forgiveness and the gift of eternal life. Lord, have mercy on me. Lord, fill me with your love, with your grace, with your power, so that I can live for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord, I just pray right now for every person who said that prayer. Sovereign God, that you would just fill them with your love and mercy, that you would seal them with your spirit. Lord, that you would fill them from head to toe. Lord, that you would take, Lord, just take them out of darkness and into light. Lord, that all hopelessness be gone. Lord, that you would fill them with hope that you fill them with peace, that you fill them with your love. Lord, for those who have become cold, Lord, right now, that the fire of your spirit were born in them. Lord, that you would fill them, that you would anoint them. Lord, that they would be passionate about you once more. Jesus, we just cry out to you and Lord, just fill each and every person with your spirit this day. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen. Oh, praise his wonderful name. Oh, he's just such an awesome God. And people don't really know what they're missing out on, do they? When you've encountered the love of Jesus, your life is never the same again. You know, when we think about the cross and all that he endured for us, you know, he is worthy of it all. You know, we want to lay down our lives. We want to run this race. We want to do all that he asks us to do. Life is so fleeting and God is preparing us for eternity. And Jesus Christ has risen from the dead and he lives. And because he lives, we too shall live. And I want to encourage you that if you said that prayer and you meant that, that your sins are blotted out. Do you know that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life? 
that he has dealt with your sin, that you've been justified by faith, meaning just as if you've never sinned, that he declares you righteous. What does that mean? It means that you have right standing before God. You know, we are children of God and we have a hope and we have a future in him. So let us rejoice and let us be glad for this is a glorious day. What is the sign of your coming, Lord God? Oh, that the hearts of many will grow cold because of lawlessness. Let us be people whose hearts are on fire. Let us be people who don't compromise or give in to sin. But let us become slave of righteousness and let us honour him and walk in the light of the Lord all the days of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.